we have uh, the first of all <coughs> the first speaker <coughs> sorry to say all of them are my friends so uh, out uh, finishes a BA in master degree in American University uh, what I can say about out that is the president of the United Armenian Fund uh, which which provide humanitarian assistance to Armenia uh, this is very important uh, uh, activity. Out uh, is considered in the US like to be the most uh, significant and powerful uh, voice of the American community, big American community in the US. And he is devoted to the issue of the Armenian genocide. I can say he has very close uh, feelings toward the Jewish people and toward Israel. I imagine that he will criticize our attitude, but it's rightly to, to do it here. He out publish uh, several, uh, several, uh, how do you say, several, no, th this book was, was uh, published three times. Every time he, he changed, he adopted the, the situation to the correct uh, time. The Armenian Genocide, the world speaks about 1915, 2015. The last one went out some months ago. It's including the declaration and the attitude of some state uh, this year. So please. Thank you. I want to start by expressing my deep appreciation and the appreciation of the Armenian people to the Open University for convening its first conference on the Armenian Genocide in Israel. The title of my uh, talk today is Quest for Justice or Genocide Recognition. Now that the centennial of the Armenian Genocide is coming to an end, Armenians consider the recognition stage of the century-old genocide basically over and turn their full attention to demanding restitution and justice rather than the mere acknowledgement of this crime against humanity. Let us quickly review the developments of this important issue over the last 100 years. In the immediate aftermath of the genocide, most survivors were scattered throughout the Middle East and the four corners of the globe. They had no food, no shelter, and barely the clothes on their back. They vainly hoped to be rescued by Christian European nations, enabling them to return to their ancestral homeland in Western Armenia and Cilicia, from which they were so brutally uprooted. Alas, it was not to be. On August 10, 1920, the Treaty of Sèvres was signed by over a dozen countries, including the British Empire, France, Italy, Japan, Turkey, and Armenia. The leaders of these countries had committed to restore justice to the long-suffering Armenian nation. The Treaty of Sèvres recognized Armenia's independence and asked President Woodrow Wilson to fix the borders between Armenia and Turkey. Unfortunately, this treaty was never ratified. The European powers reneged on their commitments to their little ally. The newly established Republic of Armenia lasted only two years before being swallowed up by the Soviet Union and Turkey. The destitute Armenian refugees abandoned to their tragic fate were forced to settle down in permanent exile. In those early years, their first priority was survival, fending off starvation and disease. Gradually, they rebuilt their lives in new homes, churches, and schools. Engaging in lobbying activities and making political demands were the last things on their minds. Every April 24, Armenians commemorated the genocide by gathering in church halls and offering prayers for the souls of one and a half million innocent victims. Successive generations, particularly after 1965, the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, try to break the wall of silence surrounding the greatest tragedy that befell the Armenian nation. Tens of thousands of Armenians in communities throughout the world held protest marches, wrote letters to government officials, and petitioned international organizations. The Turkish government, along with the rest of the world, initially turned a deaf ear to Armenian demands for recognition of the long forgotten genocide. But as media outlets, world leaders, parliaments of various countries, and international organizations began acknowledging the Armenian Genocide, Turkish leaders, astonished that the crimes perpetrated by their forefathers were making headlines after so many decades, 
started pumping massive resources into their campaign of denial. They funded foreign scholars to distort the historical facts, engaged the services of powerful lobbying firms, and applied political and economic pressure on countries acknowledging the genocide. Since 1965, over 25 countries, including Canada, France, Italy, Switzerland, Greece, Russia, Poland, Sweden, Argentina, Uruguay, and the latest Paraguay last week, recognized Armenian genocide. It is commonly assumed that the United States has not acknowledged Armenian genocide because recent US presidents, including President Obama, have failed to use the term genocide after promising to do so as, president, as a presidential candidate. The fact is that all three branches of the American government, executive, legislative, and judiciary, have repeatedly acknowledged Armenian genocide. The first time that the executive branch made a reference to the Armenian Genocide was all the way back in 1951 in a document filed by the US government with the International Court of Justice, commonly known as the World Court. The second reference to the Armenian Genocide by the executive branch was made by President Ronald Reagan when he issued Presidential Proclamation 4838 on April 22, 1981. The legislative branch of the US government adopted two resolutions confirming the historical facts of the Armenian Genocide. The first resolution by Cong was approved by the U.S. House of Representatives on April 8, 1975, designated April 24, and I quote the resolution, as a day of remembrance for all the victims of genocide, especially those of Armenian ancestry who succumbed to the genocide perpetrated in 1915, end of quote. A second resolution with similar wording was adopted by the House of Representatives on September 10, 1984. Most people are unaware that the judiciary, the third branch of the US government, has issued three federal court rulings concerning the Armenian Genocide. The first judicial reference to the Armenian Genocide was the unanimous ruling of a three-judge panel of the First Circuit Court of Appeals on August 11, 2010. The second court case was the ruling of federal judge Colleen Kolar Kotelli on January 26, 2011, in the lawsuit regarding the Armenian Genocide Museum and Memorial in Washington, D.C. The third judicial reference to Armenian Genocide was on May 3, 2012, by a three-judge panel of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, denying the claim of the Turkish Coalition of America against the University of Minnesota. In a unanimous ruling, the judges described the Armenian Genocide as, and I quote, the Turkish Genocide of Armenians during World War I, end of quote. Thus, with all three branches of the U.S. government going on record reaffirming the genocide, the United States has gained its rightful place in the ranks of righteous nations that have recognized Armenian genocide. In fact, in many respects, the United States has compiled a more extensive record of acknowledging the Armenian genocide than many other countries that have simply adopted a parliamentary resolution on this issue. International organizations that have also acknowledged the Armenian genocide, including the United Nations. The UN Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities adopted their report in 1985, prepared by Special Rapporteur Benjamin Whitaker, acknowledging that the Armenian Genocide met all the UN criteria for genocide. Two years later, in 1987, the European Parliament also adopted a resolution recognizing the Armenian Genocide. In addition, hundreds of Holocaust and genocide scholars have issued joint statements confirming the facts of the genocide. After so many acknowledgement, acknowledgments, the Armenian Genocide has become a universally recognized historical fact. Despite, despite such widespread acknowledgement, there are still a few important countries, one of which is regrettably the State of Israel, that have yet to recognize the Armenian Genocide. I must draw an important distinction between the position of the Israeli government and the people of Israel and Jews around the world who have been some of the most outspoken advocates for the recognition of the Armenian Genocide, such as Henry Morgenthau, U.S. Ambassador to the Ottoman Empire during the Genocide, Raphael Lemkin, the Polish Jewish lawyer who coined the term genocide, and he told the CBS TV program Face the Nation in a 1949 interview, quote, I became interested in genocide because it happened to the Armenians, end of quote. Next, we have Franz Werfel, the Austrian Jewish novelist who wrote the international best-selling novel, 40 Days of Musadal, in 1933. The, the book was translated into Hebrew in 1934 and was widely read by Jews everywhere, particularly in the Warsaw Ghetto, as a source of inspiration for survival and res resistance to the Nazis during the Shoah. 
I would add to these historical figures the, the name of Yossi Beilin, who spoke out on the Armenian Genocide as Minister of Justice on April 24, 2000, and as Deputy Foreign Minister in 1994, despite heavy pressures and criticisms from the Israeli government. We also remember fondly Yossi Sarid, who as Minister of Education was the keynote speaker on April 24, 2000, the 85th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. And I quote him, he said, I'm here with you as a human being, as a Jew, as an Israeli, and as Education Minister of the State of Israel. Whoever stands indifferent in front of genocide or ignores it, whoever makes calculations, whoever is silent, always helps the perpetrator of the crime and not the murderers." End of quote. I must include in this list of righteous Jews, Professor Israel Charney, Professor Yair Oron, Professor Yehuda Bauer, Nobel Peace Prize winner Eli Wiesel, and a large number of Jewish scholars who were the trailblazers in writing articles and books on the Armenian Genocide, even before Armenian scholars themselves. I must also commend the Knesset members and former Knesset chairman and current president Rivlin, who staunchly supported this issue despite the government's vehement opposition. After all, the Armenian Genocide was the prototype of the Shoah in view of German complicity in the extermination of Armenians. In the process of that criminal cooperation, the German military learned from its Turkish allies practical evil lessons on how to organize and implement the elimination of an entire race. As we all know, Hitler was emboldened by the silence of the world while our Armenians were getting wiped out to confidently declare on the eve of the invasion of Poland in 1939, who after all speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians. The State of Israel should have been the first, not the last country to recognize the Armenian genocide. Who should empathize more with the victims of a genocide than those who have suffered a similar fate? Those who give real politic reasons to justify Israel's lack of acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide should answer the following question. Would they accept the denial of the Shoah by another country simply because it is in that country's interest to do so? Equally logical is the claim that now is not the right time to recognize the Armenian genocide. genocide. When is a good time to recognize a genocide? Isn't 100 years of waiting long enough? Furthermore, for years, we were told that acknowledging the Armenian genocide would ruin Israel's good relations with Turkey. <coughs> now, we are being told that Israel, Israel cannot acknowledge it in order not to make its bad relations with Turkey worse. It would be immoral to exploit the recognition of the Armenian genocide as a bargaining chip between Turkey and Israel. No political, economic, or military interest should override the recognition of any genocide. Israel should recognize the Armenian genocide for one reason only. It is the right thing to do, to, to, to tell the truth. Countries that side with the denialist regime of Turkey are not doing so due to lack of evidence or conviction, but sadly because of political expediency with the intent of appeasing the denier. One would hope that those, these governments would join most of the enlightened world in acknowledging the historical facts as they are and not as the Turkish government wishes them to be. Armenians no longer need to convince the world that what took place from 1915 to 1923 was genocide. However, a simple acknowledgement of what took place and mere apology would not heal the wounds and undo the consequences of the genocide. Armenians are still waiting for justice to be served, restoring their historic rights and returning their confiscated lands and properties. In recent years, Armenian American lawyers have successfully filed lawsuits in US federal courts securing millions of dollars from New York Life and French Oxide insurance companies for unpaid claims to policyholders who perished in the genocide. Several more lawsuits are still pending against other insurance companies and German banks to recover funds belonging to victims of the genocide. In 1915, a centrally planned and executed attempt was made to uproot and decimate an entire nation, <coughs> depriving the survivors of their cultural heritage as well as their homes, lands, houses of worship, and personal properties. A gross injustice was perpetrated against the Armenian people, entitling them, as in the case of the Shoah, to just compensation for their enormous losses. Restitution can take many forms. As an initial step, the Republic of Turkey should place under the jurisdiction of the Armenian Patriarchate of Istanbul all the Armenian churches and religious monuments which were expropriated and converted to mosques and warehouses or outright destroyed. In the, in the absence of a voluntary restitution by Turkey, Armenia should resort to litigation seeking 
restorative justice. In considering legal, legal recourse, one should keep in mind, however, that the Armenian genocide did neither start nor end in 1915. Large-scale genocidal acts start with Sultan Abdul Hamid's massacre of 300,000 Armenians from 1894 to 1896. The subsequent killing, of the young, killing by the young Turk regime of 30,000 Armenians in Adana in 1909, culminating in the genocide of one and a half million Armenians from 1915 to 1923. In subsequent decades, tens of thousands of Armenians were forcefully Turkified or deported by the Republic of Turkey. Most of the early leaders of the Turkish Republic were high-ranking Ottoman officials who had perpetrated the Armenian genocide. This unbroken succession in leadership assured the continuity of the Ottomans' anti-Armenian policies. Today's Republic of Turkey, as the successor of the Ottoman Empire, is therefore responsible for the genocide. An important document recently discovered in U.S. archives provides irrefutable evidence that the government of Turkey continued to uproot and exile the remnants of Armenians well into the 1930s, motivated purely by racist motives. This document is a strictly confidential cable dated March 2, 1934, and sent by U.S. Ambassador Robert Skinner from Ankara to the U.S. Secretary of State, reporting the deportation of Armenians from the interior of Anatolia to Istanbul. In the 1920s and 30s, thousands of Armenian survivors of the genocide were forced out of their homes in Cilicia and Western Armenia and deported to other parts of Turkey or to neighboring countries. In the 1940s, these racist policies were followed by what is called in Turkish Varlik Vergesi, the imposition of an exorbitant wealth tax on Armenians, Greeks, and Jews, bankrupting the remnants of these communities. During the 1955 Istanbul pogroms, Many Greeks, as well as Armenians and Jews, were killed and injured, and their properties destroyed. The continuum of massacres, genocide, and deportations highlight the existence of a long-term strategy implemented by successive Turkish regimes from the 1890s to more recent times to solve the Armenian question with finality. Consequently, the Republic of Turkey is legally liable for its own crimes against Armenians as well as those committed by its Ottoman predecessors. The Turkish Republic inherited the assets of the Ottoman Empire, and therefore, it also inherited its liabilities. Finally, since Armenians often refer to their three sequential demands from Turkey, recognition of the genocide, reparations for their losses, and return of their lands, Turkish denialists have concluded that once they recognize the genocide, Armenians will then pursue their two other demands. This is one of the main reasons why Turkish leaders adamantly refused to acknowledge the Armenian genocide, fearing that its acceptance would lead to demands for restitution. They believe that by denying the first demand, recognition, they would be blocking the next two, reparations and return of the territory. While commemor commemorative resolutions adopted by legislative bodies of various countries and affirmative statements by world leaders on the Armenian genocide may alleviate the trauma experienced by the survivors and their descendants, However, they have no force of law and therefore no legal consequence. Armenians, Turks, and others involved in this unresolved, still un unresolved issue must realize that recognition of the Armenian genocide or the lack thereof will neither enable nor deter its consideration by international legal institutions. Once Turkish officials realize that recognition by itself cannot and would not automatically lead to other demands, they may no longer persist in their obsessive denial. Without waiting for any further recognition, Armenians must pursue their historic rights through legal channels, such as the International Court of Justice, where only states have jurisdiction, the European Court of Human Rights, as well as individual country courts. A good example of such legal action is the lawsuit filed earlier this year by the Armenian Church, the Catholico State of Cilicia, which was forced to re relocate to Lebanon after the genocide. The Church is now seeking the return of its former headquarters in Cis, Turkey, by initially petitioning the Constitutional Court of Turkey, and failing that, the Catholic, Catholic State plans to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Justice must be pursued by all means, through legal, political, and economic channels. After all, who could be opposed to Armenian demands for justice? Not even Turkish President Erdogan, whose ruling party is ironically called Justice and Development Party. For Armenians, seeking justice means the recovery of all losses from the genocide, including communal properties such as churches, monuments, cemeteries, schools, confiscated looted properties, and the occupied territories of Western Armenia. Therefore, 100 years after the genocide, 
the end game is not genocide recognition, but the long overdue demand for justice, which means the, the recovery of everything that can be returned and compensation for whatever cannot be returned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would you succeed in so short time to deal with so complicated issues that we need hours to hours and days and maybe more than days to deal with them. Thank you very much. Just a little correction. The first minister, uh, when he was minister in the Israeli government who went to the Armenian genocide in April 24 was Yair Saban. He went to the to the event in April 24 in, in the Armenian quarter. He said that he come in his private uh, own, not as a representative of the government. When Yossi Said went, he spoke, as you quoted, as Minister of Education. Let me say that uh, I, it's my brother, but I have to mention it, not because he is my brother. He was the first time in 2007 who raised the issue in the Israeli Knesset, and since then, every year, every year, the, this party, Merit's party, raised the issue in the parliament around April. I just want to say that two times, uh, in the beginning, the government threw it out, but two times uh, it went to the, the uh, to the Committee of Education, because other times it went to the Security uh, Committee, and of course, it was blocked. In the two events, there was majority for recognition. But then the government used bureaucratic uh, ways to stop the debate. But just I want to say that the Speaker of the Knesset last year went specially to this meeting and he declared openly that is in opinion the, gov the Knesset has to recognize the Armenian genocide. And I know that he is look I know that he is looking for the correct time to uh, to raise the issue. He wants to get majority, and of course he has to struggle with his government, which is also his own party. Thank you.